Welcome, aloha. I hope you're all doing well. You might check and just see each other visually. That's all we can do. <laughs> Enjoy the support of our Dhamma friends. The connection. I wanted to um, begin with a poem by the Wang An Shi. He lived from 1021 to 1086 in China. It's called um, Here Now. Clouds rise out of Bell Mountain, then vanish into Bell Mountain peaks. Just ask mountain monks about the place clouds are now. Part two, clouds appear out of no mind, then vanish back into no mind depths. No mind, no place to seek. Not seeking is no mind's place. We're sensing a lot of you getting quieter and uh, I think sometimes when we have some clouds in the sky and look up and um, they're not solid, like a, a very strong um, weather front of clouds, but just some, some um, way that we see movement in the clouds that often uh, will have a sense of a way of being of the clouds coming and going. Um, that is much more like how our body, minds, and hearts really are. If we give them a chance, if we stop fiddling and manipulating, manipulating and controlling so much, but just, just letting them be, not trying to let go of anything, but just really leaving, leaving our thoughts alone, just letting them be, let them just come and go, or just letting physical sensations be just like clouds moving through the sky, emotions, just instead of attacking anger, or running away, just letting it be, letting it have a life come and go by itself. And this, this is an art of, we want to be peaceful, um, but our conditioning is so intense. Uh, to not be peaceful. So the talk today, um, we'll see what happens with uh, the talk, but it's, I'm going to be touching base on some of the factors of awakening. The, the factors of an awakening or enlightenment, uh, they're, they're meant to describe um, aspects of an awake moment that are, are in balance. So the first is mindfulness. I probably won't talk about that that much today, but there's an assumption that in the terms of the seven factors of an awakening, that mindfulness is always there. And it's, it's like, um, I like to describe it as a, a weaving, if you, um, have ever seen a weaving take place, there's the warp that you thread. And that uh, I think of the warp as mindfulness and the weft, which is what you're weaving back and forth on the warp um, are the other six factors of enlightenment or awakening. And they really, um, 
are, are really so, so wonderful to hear that um, the Buddha said that uh, the devas would come around to listen to the seven factors when the Buddha talked because they bring so much brightness to the mind and inspiration to the heart. So we invite the devas everywhere to listen. And to remember when we're talking about these factors that, um, you know, I've seen people just spend years uh, just with calm. And they'll come in for an interview and complain that that's all that's happening. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll say, you know, I'll try to put this in perspective, like calm is like really actually quite wonderful, right? But, you know, they get sick of it. You know, and yet you can't second guess this, you can't control it. Sometimes it might be um, concentration or investigation, or it, it's often uh, no matter what we do, it's not in our hands. There's an unfolding of our practice that's very individual uh, and um, based on many factors. But we can understand uh, what these factors are at times, and they're not a checklist, uh, but the Buddha did describe them in a certain kind of order that um, Upandita uh, had talked about so much. I, I really f have a great um, respect for that order, as well as that um, we will have individual of these um, awakening factors happening at different times that don't don't feel like they're linear at all and they actually aren't that linear yeah so i wanted to begin with um we practice, some of our motivation pr for practice is actually the seven factors of awakening appearing and also um, the cultivation and deepening of these factors. So sometimes when there's a little bit of mindfulness and a little bit of energy or investigation, some calm concentration, it doesn't mean, or I'm not saying that all seven are there, but there's enough of them that it'll feel like our practice has come together in a way that we would, we will usually say is what we would call good practice. <laughs> and um, that's a tricky little uh, idea in and of itself, but it, it does feel like um, one feels really much more present, much more inspired, much more um, awake. And we're also um, at these times, not usually, of course, we're not supposed to be thinking about that when these uh, factors come uh, appear and they stay a while, we're not necessarily relating to them as we're washing our, we're in a washing machine and that there's, uh, <laughs> it's like uh, our body, mind, heart is being washed like in warm soapy water. These seven factors are like warm soapy water. And the longer we're in them, the more washing happens. And eventually the dirt comes out. And when the dirt starts coming out, it's usually when the energy starts to go down. This is not not, not our design, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's really just how it happens. That as that energy goes down, something that we are actually identified with still, right? We're not fully awake, we're not fully enlightened. The, th the things that we really need to see to work with that we're having trouble with will start to come up. They start to come out. It's like, and in fact, we want that to happen. We want to get free. We want to be awake. Uh, but we call that 
period of practice where the stuff comes up and of course we resist it. We get attached to the, what we call our good practice. We don't like that we're resisting what's coming up. Um, we, we tend to not go, oh boy, I was hoping anger would come right up right now when, that when it isn't, you know, when we're having this idea that, you know, maybe this time nothing else is going to come up. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe I don't have to do this anymore. Whatever it is, we think we're um, invincible. And often when the seven factors are strong, we really will feel invincible. Like, well, maybe I don't have to have any more purification happen. And then whew, it, switch, it switches. And it's like we, we re often will resist. And um, it's usually a while goes by before we go, oh, 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 all right. I was hoping attachment would come up because I need more practice and being mindful right, of this. And this is when we really start to get what freedom is. We say it over and over. We're not trying to get rid of anything. In the moment that aversion comes up, if we think it shouldn't appear, we're in prison. If we have a relationship where we know we can be mindful of it, and not, it's not ours, and we don't have to identify with it, we'll want to have a better relationship with it. So we can be liberated. We don't have to, we're, it's like you go from being really perturbable to peace. And that's how you get free. You get, you get such a good relationship with it. It doesn't bother you anymore. You're peaceful. No problem. I remember when um, a good uh, old student of mine came to Burma and asked uh, the happy Sayadaw oh, in Burma, um, do you ever get angry? Uh, and he, he said, um, I get angry when I feel misunderstood. And then I am mindful of it and it disappears. Ha, 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 ha. So for him, he was describing, you know what, a few seconds of like, oh, that moment of feeling misunderstood having such a good relationship with it, he saw it clearly, the mindfulness saw it clearly, didn't take it personally. And, and it, it, it extinguished itself. So that Jesse's talk about extinguishment, it's like, if you understand their clouds, whatever appears will disappear if you get out of the way. It, it can't last, it's conditioned. So it's, it's hard to remember that when we really are holding on or pushing away and we can't see it clearly, of course, it feels, it will feel, in fact, the nature of when we're suffering the most is usually when we feel like an experience is permanent, right? It's like we have no space. It doesn't have any sense of clouds at all moving. It's just so solid. Ugh, it's so hard sometimes. But with practice, we start to even, with these things, remember, oh, at least we know it doesn't feel impermanent, but we know it is impermanent. So if, if it's sometimes this, this kind of description of the practice is it's like the, the seven factors of awakening and the hindrances are, are what come up, aversion, attachment, sleepiness, restlessness, doubt, that this, it can seem like when we practice um, for a while, there's like a war between those two um, parts of the mind, right? The, set, the awakening factors, the hindrances, but as you practice, you start being able to relate to the hindrances in a way that you know if you're with them, that you know if you start investigating them, that you will get more and more liberated. There's less and less of a war, less and less of a war, less and less of a war. Mm -hmm. 
so the mindfulness again be, because there's such limited time i'm not going to go into that much um but in, in the context of this talk i'm describing mindfulness as soft readiness that readiness for anything to happen because anything can happen any moment. And so often I think we'll like the childlike part of us comes to practice because we want to be able to control what happens with our meditation. Um, that's natural, right? We, 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 we keep being surprised that it's not about um, being able to control what happens. So that, that shifting to, um, I remember Upandita would say to me a lot, you know, Vipassana is cultivating an attention, a mind that is ready for anything to happen, ready for anything to happen. Because, and he didn't say it, because I had to keep reminding self, myself, because the truth is anything can happen. That's anicca, impermanence. So the next factor, I guess I'll say that is that the first three are um, meant to be energizing, and then the second three are meant to be tranquilizing. So there's mindfulness, and then the, that, that's the um, warp, and then the weft is the energizing, investigation, courageous energy, and joyful interest or rapture, PT, and then the next three tranquilizing are calm, concentration, equanimity. So sometimes I think we want to investigate how things are, but we will get caught in using our willpower in investigating how things are. And I, I liken that to like if you ever plant a seed in the soil, you have a garden and you have just dirt. It's amazing, just earth and you put the seed under the earth it, in the darkness. It's so powerful. I think whenever I plant a seed and it actually <laughs> comes up, it's so amazing. You know, I had very little to do with it, right? You put it in, you try to have reasonable soil, you try to like not overwater it or give it too much sunlight. You can't give it too much sunlight. It's not supposed to have it yet. And I think we need to approach investigation like that. It's like, um, even if it's just like we know that too much sunlight, it's too bright, is damaging. And the mind, we use our willpower and we kind of laser beam in on something. And it's not that we, um, don't end up having a kind of that power of laser beam, um, but it, it's, it's if you're motivated by that kind of um, trying to pounce on the experience and, and know it, know it intellectually within a few seconds, it's like, it, it, it kills connection. So what, when we go to investigate something, again, it's like, try to remember, it's about a relationship and um, intimacy and safety and trust. It's subject object. If, we, if there's a subject object, uh, then the subject, if they're uh, using willpower in investigation, then the motivation is gonna backfire. If we're motivated by fear, even we know all this from physical pain. Physical pain requires such tenderness, such care, apamada, carefulness, just as the approach. And usually our approach is like, you know, we don't even consider it. We just really want it to go away if it's intense. Or a mental state like, like grief or anger, it's like we, we're even less clear with the mind, the mental state, the emotion around bludgeoning it versus is there some ability to sort of know it's like this little tiny sprout that we don't have a very good relationship with. 
this doesn't mean that we're taking it personally. It means the opposite. It means we're starting to really try to understand that this has nothing to do with self-centered awareness. It's not my anger. It's not my happiness. It's not my enjoyment. It's not my whatever. So we hopefully start to get some reverence and respect for that process of aliveness itself. And it's like trying to investigate a butterfly or a flower petal. The breath, how delicate the breath is, the lungs, you know, how delicate they are. So the clarity comes from the clearer motivation. The light in the mind is not coming from having this um, motivation of laser beam. It comes from the carefulness of the uh, motivation and then the dropping in and the being with. And it, um, it gets clearer and clearer. The clarity comes from um, a relationship of mindfulness and kindness. And so often with, um, I'm using these metaphors because often the, the description of investigation itself is like going from the dark to like turning a light on in the room. So it's like going from underneath the earth and trusting and then starting to ask a question, you know, what is really happening right now? That's all investigation is what's really happening now. But the minor detail is that it's, we're going from conceptual knowledge to non-conceptual knowledge. We're going to, from um, a memory. So say we, we bring our attention to our hands. The, of course we have a visual image. Of course we have many memories of hand, but investigation requires our ability to not know to absolutely not know that, that nothing from the past is present, that there isn't a visual image. Of course, that doesn't mean we have to be careful with, in that moment, there might not be the visual image. There might be a visual image the next moment. We might start with a visual image and there's no problem with that. It's so hard to teach this because this, we're not trying to reject conceptual reality. We're not trying to reject visual image Clearly, we're not trying to make reality disappear. We're trying to shift our perspective to open up the prison of conditioned reality. And of course, to the, the great prison of thinking we know everything. It's arrogant. We, we're trying to go from arrogance to humility from arrogance to humility. And it's not something we're making up. It's really just the truth. The truth is that you never know what the next moment is. You never know what that next moment of the experience of hands are, or the next moment of what a thought is. That's how vulnerable we are. And, and that's how mysterious it is and awesome and vast. This shift from trying to come down, come down and be still to actually being able to explore, not through the lens of fear and desire, right? This investigation is not exploring for the, through the lens of fear and desire. But of course, if we see fear or desire, you shift to being interested in investigate that, right? There's no problem. Whatever appears is okay. But you start to start to get it, hopefully get interested in this. So when we start to try to investigate anything, whether it's the wind or a bird song or uh, anything in the mind or body, anything that appears, of course, the past memory of it will probably appear. And so it's accepting that there's a kind of starts to be this seamless dance between, oh, that's a bird, 
And can we bring our attention back to the, the sound appearing and receiving it directly? Or, oh, um, that's, that's my elbow, <laughs> right? Maybe the visual image, there's some sensation there. And then can we bring our attention to just what's there, just what's there? And maybe a picture in the mind of elbow, that's a memory. No problem. That's a memory appearing in the present moment. And you, you just start to um, have great patience. And what we're encouraging you not to be in a hurry. We're in such a hurry to define, to nail it down and to move on. That's not what this is about. <laughs> Eight in the morning, five minutes past, whatever, and we're like calling it a day because we want to just get it over with, right? But we were born, we're going to live it out and die. This takes time. So this ability to wait and connect, wait, connect, wait, have the conceptual, non-conceptual come uh, to, to let this um, amorphousness or the fogginess, or it's like um, often when we're really with what's happening, there's not much there. And that's disconcerting in itself. What is that? You can go and in, delve into the words of quantum physics and nano moments, right? We have all these words, um, but when you start imagining even the old, you know, the old microscopes to what they have now, and then, you know, what would it be like to look at your thumb through one of the, the most modern, you know, microscopes, it's like you would probably see nothing or very little, you'd see mostly space. Hence the uh, poem about the clouds. Um, so that this, this is a talk about how the faith and the trust develop, because there starts to be a trust, not just of um, knowing things intellectually, knowing things conceptually, but you start having faith in letting the attention explore non-conceptually, because that's where insight happens. So we, we're not trying to figure out impermanence, for example, through the thought process, we're trying to directly experiencing, experience um, impermanence through the direct experience. And there might be an aha at some point, um, but it's coming, the insight's not coming through figuring it out intellectually. We might reflect on it, of course, to integrate the insight, we reflect on it. We include the thought process. Kind of fun. When I did a lot of um, my early practice, I did a lot of long retreats, um, but sometimes I would have to call um, my dad. And um, I had a stepmother that didn't like me and very much. <laughs> and my stepmother would always answer the phone. Uh, but often I would have to talk to my dad, but it would be hard for her. She actually did want to get talk to me. It was, it, you know, it was kind of her ambivalence and confusion. But I was, I would be a yogi that like had been sitting for a long time. And I'd have to kind of build up to calling. Um, but I learned so much from the experience of um, 
so many years, I would want my stepmother to be different. And I'd want her to like me more or us not to have such um, a hard time. And so I would have that lens when I would call. It, it was so painful. And so um, I'd want the conversation to be a certain way. And it wasn't. <laughs> And I could never, it took me so long to accept. And finally, it was like, I'll never forget it because I, I, I had the phone. This is the old days. This was a phone booth down in the basement, you know, and I'm in the phone booth and I'm like the phone. And I thought, oh, this is what happens when I call my stepmother. That's it. No problem. It was so huge. Now, I didn't try to belabor that or figure it out or, you know, this was just a moment I came in there and I realized that it was okay. That she was okay the way she was. I'm okay the way I am. And that I needed to just be with that experience. And what was so amazing is that I would always want my dad, <laughs> I had both the different, different motivations for different people right but with my dad I'd want him to like be interested in me on any level like uh, just anything anything and um, he couldn't so he would always talk about the weather this is you know Massachusetts the, the New England he was he's so good at talking about the weather and I would just um for years, again, I would be so upset. I mean, <laughs> it would be like after the phone call, it would take me days to recover, you know, because uh, I'd want, I'd want, 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 want. Of course, it was harder with my dad than my, even my stepmother. Um, uh, and then later in life, what was so amazing as years went on, um, and I was would be going through stuff on the retreat, and I'd call a vet, you know, I didn't call a lot. I'm not saying I was calling a lot, but there'd be times when I would have to. Um, and I would be so happy my dad wasn't interested. And I'd be so happy he'd want to talk about the weather. It became, you know, in my later years with him, I, I didn't, I wanted to talk about whether he started wanting to talk about other stuff and it would just be so soothing. And it was like, oh, this is, this is how my dad is. It was so nice. And, you know, that, that fickleness of my own motivation and my relationship to all of it, you know, and it's like the acceptance that, that this was my, this was what he could do. This is all he could do. And that that was okay. In his last two months of his life in the hospital at Mass General in Boston, it was like, I was so grateful that I had been able to do the practice so thoroughly to the point where whatever was happening, <laughs> which was a lot of drama with my family and, you know, just um, being okay with how he was. It's another longer story, but he could be very hostile to the point where he was freaking out. Even the most solid of the doctors that would walk in the room, they couldn't handle it, you know? So like there's levels to like how my dad was, but I'd always say, don't worry, I'll go in. I can, I can handle it. I know how to do this, you know? So this motivation, as you start to do this practice and keep going with it, you start to see that it's everything. And um, what time do I start? Okay. When you move from investigation to energy in terms of the factors of awakening, um, 
I, I have mentioned it even this retreat, but the description that Upandita would give of this was so beautiful because he'd say, you know, you're, you're applying, you've, you've, in terms of a linear sequence, we've applied mindfulness, we've applied investigation in the ways that I'm saying. And then with the, the energy, and as Steve mentioned this, it's like that courage, the courage it takes to take a closer look. the courage to be humble enough to stick with it, however, to sustain the attention with it, and no matter what it is. And so say we have trouble with the breath controlling it. Say, say we've had a history of, of um, bringing our attention there and controlling it. Um, I would say that rather than get too serious about it, to play with it a bit and to actually just take a few seconds of it. As, you know, the question and answer period was mentioning this, just taking a little bit, right? You take a little dose of something that's hard. So you maybe you do half of um, the rising movement, you see if you can be with it and then you move away to the hands or um, the sound. And that could be time to call it a day with the breath. That's good enough if it's hard. And of course we might think, oh, this pace is terrible, <laughs> but it's not terrible. If your motivation is just, oh, I got a teeny bit of a relationship with this without controlling it and it's hard, that's all it is. And then if you can do that, whatever it is, it could be pain in the body we're afraid of. It could be an emotion we're afraid of. But whatever, taking that little dose of intimacy, right, the way it is, it would be like my father with the weather. I would start to be able to actually be with it rather than be motivated that he should change. So I got to be able to have longer and longer conversations and not get frustrated. Well, this is, it's the same with everything. It's like whatever it is that you notice there's controlling, you find that little dose move away. And then the second part of this is starting to get interested in controlling. And not the, not the thought process controlling, but the attention itself that tightens, that, that is, that's fiddling you know, and to start turning the attention, not on the object like the breath or pain or whatever, but you shift the attention to the attention itself. If you have something you're trying to control, you have a controller. There's this duality of subject, object, controller, controlled, and none of us really want to have that kind of power over something, really. It's violent. It's cruel. And who is it that's controlling? It's just fear and desire. It, it, what is a human being? Uh, what is a person? And it's like a person is just temporary moments of identification with fear or delusion or anger or desire. And so you're, you're just starting to get interested in that process, it, it, it's so exciting actually. <laughs> and when we think about physical matter, physical sensation, the mind is actually much slipperier. I talk about a butterfly or a petal of a flower, but aversion is harder to see than that. It's much more nebulous. You know, we try to look at disliking and whoom. You try to look at a thought, whoom. It's like, it's so much more insubstantial. And yet they have more power over us. Um, so we're getting to this idea of trust and faith. And so the idea of trust and the way I'm describing this is that when our system says no, you with a few seconds with the rising movement and it says no. Why would you override that? There's no trust in that. It's violent. It's mean. 
And it's not understanding that we can be with the resistance or we can be with sound. We, there's so many other things to pay attention to. You're, it's not a failure. It's not weakness. It's wise. It's wise. Why? Because you'll develop more trust and you'll start to get a relationship with resistance. Now, if you look at how much we're actually in the present moment, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> You'll start to get to see how much resistance there is and how slippery it is because do you choose to go off? No, rarely. You just find that you've gone and you've, you're actually fine that you're gone and you have a choice to come back. But did you choose to get lost in a thought? No, rarely. That's how slippery it is. And that's how much trust this takes. This takes the trust to go, oh, that's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's just like being with a little kid that says, I can't do this. I can't be with this. What is this? Reality, the truth, things as they are. So this is a growing up process spiritually. It's going from being childish spiritually to growing up. So if we're saying no, 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 and we get upset at the no, there's no peace. Not, not possible, even if it's a habit. So often, you know, we hear the teachings and we want to be ahead of ourselves. And it's, it's like, usually if you look at like you want to be fully enlightened, which is what I fall for, you know, um, when things aren't going my way, I want to be fully enlightened more than ever. You know, or it's like whatever, you know, that um, we want to be, we don't want to be controlling the breath. We don't want to be, we want less fear. We want less driving. We want whatever it is we're not wanting or wanting. Take a look at it. It's always when we're not, liking what's happening in the present moment. So that again, that motivation, that striving as a motivation for practice will burn out. Not in that healthy extinguishment way. It'll just burn us out because it has nothing to do with what's happening. What in, so if we're striving, just again, it's a, just a little investigation. What's really happening? What is the hidden object? You know, it's usually striving and wanting. And then we start to see that we can actually be interested in the controller as well as what we're trying to control. And it takes great kindness, great. Maybe we do some metta or compassion and the compassion feels good. To have compassion for all us controllers on the planet. <laughs> That's a worthy task. That feels good. It feels so good to care about us all. Doing the best we can. Oh. So it's okay to want to control. It's okay to resist. It's like that acceptance. It's not condoning. Acceptance doesn't mean condoning that it means that that's what's happening it means that you get a relationship with it so that you have compassion that you understand and the understanding is that there's no one who is controlling there is no one who's resisting it's like thoughts without a thinker it's just this um you know there's some there's a few breaths there's some sounds there's controlling there's some happiness, there's peace, there's joy, there's sorrow. It's like learning to, you can be mindful of every experience. Where are we?
Oh, there might be a part two, but um, rapture, PT. That's the third of the energizing factors, and it's um, one description I saw of this in the Pali dictionary that I'll never forget. It had such impact that this is the deep delight in the truth. And to me, it's like taking the um, young heart of a child and putting, you know, weaving it together with the wisdom of the sage. The sage usually comes from applying everything that we're saying, the, the wisdom, the kindness. And so you see with the, the joyful interest, it's a kind of um, wonder and awe uh, but it includes pleasure and pain and neutral. It includes the deep delight in things as they are. So it, it includes pain, it includes neutral, it includes pleasure. And so the, the, that prison, that chain we have to the, to the consciousness, pleasure, pain, neutral consciousness, um, it's broken. Any moment you're interested in neutral or um, pain, that oppression, is broken. It's that significant. One moment of it is that significant. Srinasargadatta says the ending of this pattern is the ending of the personal self. The personal self is desire, the identification with desire, fear, delusion, anger. So with rapture, which um, somebody mentioned in the questions this morning, um, I think that it's important to remember that as we bring our attention to what is less solid, less visual, and we're aware of um, it, our direct experience as being less solid, there are energy surges that happen. You know, there, there are ways in which <laughs> my favorite is when, you know, I'll be teaching a retreat in person more, but looking out and seeing people actually peeking at their hand or peeking at their body because the memory of it is one thing. You know, your memory of your face, look in the mirror, is very different if you close your eyes and you actually experience tingling, right, warmth. It's completely different than the visual image. And it's much less solid. I mean, the amount of attention we give to how we look, mostly in this culture, is almost um, beyond comprehension. When you actually close your eyes and just experience it, what's the big deal, right? I mean, really, it's, you know, tingling warmth, coolness, <laughs> pressure, right? Streaming, sometimes intense heat, right? But it's like when you start letting the attention actually be in these experiences and not pop up and think about it as much, but just be in it, it's energizing and it's less solid. Uh, and of course, it takes time to get used to that. We'll get, we'll get, oh, this is too much. And then you don't push that. You don't, you don't push it, just go to hands or sound. You don't have to stay in it as long as, um, stay in it as long as it feels okay. No problem. Sometimes that um, rapture, the PT is unpleasant. And I've always found the uh, translation kind of mysterious in terms of English. PT, of course, it makes sense, but rapture, when I started having unpleasant aspects of, of rapture, it was just like, well, why did they name it, <laughs> name it this? Because sometimes you'll feel huge jolts in the body of energy, like, or, or um, you know, the nice little, um, Goosebumps could become, um, you know, like a lightning bolt, or it can become so refined and so beautiful. It, it's just variable um, aspects again of, you know, we have um, beautiful little 
lakes that have rivulets of water and we have tsunamis, right? We have volcanoes, we have little warm little fires, right? We have this range. And uh, when we start letting the body be and just um, be as it is, we find it all inside. We don't have to search outside. As uh, Suzuki Roshi said, if you've understood a frog, you've understood everything. So with the rapture um, and the energy of it and that delight, it can become over exuberant, too energized. And again, that's why we suggest, you know, learn, learn from the beginning how to step on the clutch, go into neutral, go to sound, go to um, hands, the whole body posture, open eyes. You know, you get more conceptual. No problem, that's fine. And so that, that pacing again makes it safer to explore. I always think of um, in Northern Maine where I lived and my friends had these, um, they were called coon cats, but the wild cat, wild cat, but um, feral, but my friends took a few into their home and that um, they took them in in the autumn. And then in the winter when the, well, <laughs> in Maine, it's not winter, in <laughs> early autumn, it would snow. And um, I, I was there visiting when the first big snow happened and these this cat like went to the door, it wanted to go out and it, it just like never had experienced snow and it put its paw in the snow and then it ran back in and hid for a long time, yeah. And then it's like, it, it tried it again, that curiosity um, and wanting to explore it, but then ran in and that's how this is that you, you, you really wanna have a great respect for that too. It's like you get, you get more and more able to explore on that non-conceptual level and then you, you shift to ordinary or very light awareness, ordinary. In fact, for me, ordinary has been the hardest to explore. It's been a lot of my practice in recent years because I, I didn't accept ordinary. <laughs> Great description of my dad, right? He was ordinary. He just wanted to talk about the weather. I, I didn't want that, right? So awakening includes everything, all experience. So in other words, if we like only eagles and we're not interested in sparrows, the practice will bring us to sparrows. We're not gonna reject the eagles, we'll always love them, but we'll learn to love the sparrows as well. And it's not always, um, when we get a taste of the deep delight and the truth of things, and if it starts to get too energized or too over exuberant, I think it's really important to look at the um, face of the Buddha. Just to, to remember that image has such serenity, such peace. It's like there's, it's so balanced. The seven factors are so balanced. Um, and it's not like the Buddha is going off like a rocket into like so high, right? He's not high. He's peaceful. So it's, it's that energy, energize goes, shifts into calm and concentration and equanimity, which, um, I'll probably do in my next talk. But I, I did um, two things I just wanna mention and I'll go into it more in the next talk, but um, the, the directed attention and anchoring and the choiceless awareness are, are really, equally important in this practice. And, and it's, it's um, they're skillful means. 
and to, to be careful that one is better than the other or you know one is um, more liberating just to be careful As the motivation um, gets more and more clear, uh, it's less confusing about whether to be anchoring or choiceless awareness. But it's all good practice, so it's not too worrisome if <laughs> you do more of one than the other at any point in time. You, your system will eventually uh, balance itself. And if you listen to your system, get more interested in listening to the resistance and paying attention more and more trust more and more balance so i'd like to end um it's just uh two things one is that we've we've said it already this morning but just we really feel good about your practice and this retreat and um mm. Yeah, it's such a joy to be with you. This is uh, one of the late poems of Wang, Wang An Shi. I read from him at the beginning of the talk. This is called Dream. Knowing lifetimes are like dream. I search for nothing now. Searching for nothing. A mind is perfectly empty, perfectly quiet. And so deep in dream, it traces borderlands of dream, clear through river and shoreline sands to the end of dream. I like to think of the end of suffering as the end of dream. Let's sit for a minute. Hmm. So please come to the metta chance it if you can. It's a, a beautiful way to be together. Wishing well all beings everywhere. <laughs>